In the Bible that I was studying this week, there are 257 pages in the New Testament. You don't have to do the math in your own Bible, but that's from Matthew 1 through Revelation 22. And so I'm sitting studying and I was thinking, man, that's, that's not that many pages. But as I'm looking into our key word for today, faithfulness, I started looking at just how often this word, it's, it's actually the word pistis in the Greek. That's not how you pronounce it. You can go to Google and find out the correct pronunciation. I don't speak Greek, uh, but that's the word that's used. And it is used 227 times. This word for faith or faithfulness, 227 times in a New Testament that in my Bible was only 257 pages. That's an important word. That's, that's used a lot. In fact, there are only three books in the New Testament that don't use that word at all. The Gospel of John, 2 John, and 3 John. So naturally, when I get to heaven, I got a couple questions for the Apostle John. Uh, but if you have been to church uh, for probably any length of time, you've, you've heard this word faith. We use it all the time. Have faith in God. You're a good and faithful servant. Be a faithful husband, a faithful wife. And so this morning, we are talking about faithfulness as we continue to look at the fruit of the Spirit. And to remind you of the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to look at Galatians 5, and 23. It says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The, uh, the law is not against such things. So imagine, if you will, that we could double click on that word faithfulness. I believe if we were able to do that, we would be taken to Hebrews 12, which is where we're going to camp out this morning. You can start making your way to Hebrews 12 uh, as we begin. But before we get to that passage, I want to give us a working definition, a biblical definition of the word faith. And for that, we actually go to Hebrews 11. It's going to be on the screen for you. Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. This is a pretty elementary definition. But it helps us to realize that, that faith is not something tangible. It's not something that we can place our hands on. But it does impact our attitude and thereby impacts our actions. So if faith or, or faithfulness is, is an attitude, it's a characteristic, it's a quality that the Holy Spirit graciously gives to us as part of the fruit of the Spirit. The question then is, how does this impact our walk with the Lord? So this morning, we're going to see that every believer, every person who's put their faith and their hope and their trust in Jesus can thrive in their relationship with God by understanding three principles of faithfulness that we see right here in Hebrews 12. Would you look on with me starting in verse one? It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I want to start in the middle of this passage with actually verse 2 as we see our first encouragement. The first principle that, that we need to understand is that faithfulness, it begins with Jesus. Faithfulness begins with Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2, it says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Your version may use the word author there instead of pioneer, the author and perfecter. I actually prefer that word author a little bit better uh, because it carries with it the idea that Jesus has written the story that Jesus has started the process, that Jesus himself uh, initiated our faith. And, and, and that's something that he has done. Our faithfulness is only possible because Jesus was faithful. 
Paul reminds us of God's faithfulness in our salvation, in our calling to him when he writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, faithful God has provided everything that we need in Jesus. Faithful God has brought us to himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. Faithful God empowers us by his spirit through the gifts of the fruit of the spirit to be faithful as well. Jesus is the author Jesus is the pioneer of our faith because he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He took our sin, he took our place, he took the wrath of God that that we deserve from the sin in our lives and he made a way for us to know and to walk with God. As the author, he wrote the story so that we would know, love, and experience God, a God who we must have faith to believe in because it's a God who we cannot see, touch, or feel, but this is a God who loved us enough, who gave everything for us. Pastor and theologian Charles Spurgeon said this, my faith rests not in what I am or shall be or feel or know, but in what Christ is in what he has done, and in what he is doing for me. Faithfulness begins with Jesus. But also as we keep reading, we see our second principle is that faithfulness is perfected by Jesus. Look back at Hebrews 12 too. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the, the author and the perfecter of our faith. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence as we read through the pages of scripture that we see similar teachings over and over. We even see some of the same wording over and over as we look throughout the Bible. God is constantly and consistently sharing his message of redemptive grace and love at every turn on every page. So not only is Jesus the pioneer, but he's also the perfecter of our faith. And I believe we can look at this in two ways, that Jesus is the perfecter. First is that faith is and and was perfected in Jesus. You see, Jesus was faithful to the will of God in, in his life as he walked on this earth. He came, he lived a perfect life, and he obediently went to the cross on our behalf. Do you remember the scene at the Garden of Gethsemane? The night that Jesus was to be betrayed by Judas, he withdrew to pray. And this wasn't one of those touchy-feely, God, thank you for all the blessings and all the great things that you have done kind of prayers. Jesus in the garden is pleading with God on three separate occasions to take what is before him away. To spare his life and to bring about redemption, salvation, restoration in some other way. Here are the words of Jesus. He says this three times. We see this one in the account of Matthew. It says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You see, God's answer to the plead of his son was to stay the course to be faithful to your purpose, to be faithful to your calling. And Jesus was. Later on, uh, Paul writes about the attitude that we see in Jesus in Philippians 1. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not only was faith perfected in Jesus as our example, but the second way we can look at him being the perfecter of our faith is that he will perfect our faith as well. Several years ago, we bought a house, and in the words of Sarah, it was for its potential. 
which you all know means that it was a disaster. And it, and it truly was. The house was hideous. You walked in and, and from the, the entryway, you could see six different kinds of tile. They weren't the same color. They didn't match. It's like they went to Home Depot and whatever was the tile of the week, they bought some of it, not all of it, not enough of it, but some of it just to stick in places. It was truly horrible. I could tell you awful things about this house, but like mustard yellow would be a, a compliment to what the colors of the wall actually were. I'm getting off track. <clears throat> So this house had all kinds of potential, right? So we close on the house and we immediately get to work. I took 2,700 pounds of tile from that house to the dump. We replaced all the flooring. We painted every wall. We hung new doors. We did new fixtures. We, we did a, a total gut job on this house. It was safe. It was clean and it, and it was mostly new. And when friends would come over to have dinner, they would bring their kids over to play. It was noticeable. And people would say, man, look at the transformation. This is so great. I love your house. And, you know, we, we would appreciate that. But what others saw as finished, we knew was only part of the way there. We knew that there was still electrical work that needed to be done. There was a part of the roof that, that still had some patchwork that needed to happen on it. There were other projects and things that, that we needed to do to really complete the house, to get it to where we wanted it to be. And friends, we're that house. We're a complete mess with six different kinds of tile and ugly walls. At the moment of salvation, we are given the fullness of Jesus. He saves us and he seals us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He makes the house of our lives safe, clean, and new. But friends, he is not done working on us yet. There are still parts of our lives that he wants us to fully give over to him. There is still wiring that needs to be fixed and doors that need to be hung. But here's the great thing about Jesus is that he promises to keep working on us, to keep perfecting us until that day when we are with him. Philippians 1.6 says it this way, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And as Hebrews 12 said, that Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. So not only was faith perfected in Jesus, was faithfulness perfected in Jesus, but he is also about the business of perfecting us. The project that he himself began. Faithfulness begins with Jesus. It is perfected by Jesus. But the third principle for this morning is that faithfulness is a daily choice. Faithfulness is a daily choice. And to be clear, our faithfulness is not what saves us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. Our faithfulness is not what saves us, but our faithfulness is a choice that we have the opportunity to make every single day. You see, God calls us to a holy and righteous life. What he does, as we have seen, is he does initiate our faith. And then he gives us the example of Jesus and his faithfulness. He also gives us the ability to be faithful by the gift of the fruit of the Spirit. And so maybe to say this a little more simply is that God starts our faith, God sustains our faith, and God empowers us to walk in faithfulness. How cool is that? So let's look back at Hebrews 12 to see what walking in faithfulness can look like. Hebrews 12, we're going to read 1 through 4. Uh, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. 
Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. God gives us the ability to walk in faithfulness, to live the way that he has called us to live and and designed us to live. The Bible tells us that God, through the power of his spirit, he convicts us of our sin, that he gives us wisdom and understanding, and that through the Holy Spirit, he will guide us in all truth. God gives us everything that we need to to walk in faithfulness. And I love verse one because there is something clear and tangible that we have the choice to make as believers. And then here in just a moment, we're even gonna see the how. But Hebrews 12, it says, lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. In order to be faithful today, to walk in faithfulness, we must cast off every hindrance and sin. We must lay them aside. Now, does that mean that you're never gonna sin again? Absolutely not. We will all struggle with sin. We will all struggle as long as we are on this earth. There is a battle that is raging between our flesh and the spirit. In fact, right before, and and you can go back to our Galatians series and and you can hear this message uh, about Galatians 5.17, but right before the fruit of the spirit, Paul tells us about this battle. He says, uh, for the flesh desires what is against the spirit and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. The battle is real. The battle is raging. And our faithfulness hangs in the balance. But this is a battle that is fought day by day and moment by moment. And we are to cast off the hindrance and the sin. And I love that the author of Hebrews, I love that the Lord doesn't just leave it at that. Oh, it's that easy. Just just cast that off. Just walk away from that. But he gives us the how. And I saved it right there in Hebrews 12, 2. And it says this, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Many of you have seen my adorable little daughter, Grace. She will be three years old in two weeks. And she is every bit of three years old. If you know, if you're a parent, you know what that means. But Grace, uh, from, from time to time, will just take off running. Like she's super excited. She sees something in the distance and she will take off running. But like most three-year-olds, uh, she might catch something out of the side of her eye. And while she's meaning to run this way, she kind of starts veering off, Right? The scarier version is when she takes off running and she's moving those little legs as fast as they'll go and then she hears something behind her. And so you would think, okay, we're gonna stop and look, figure out what's going on and then continue on, but not in the mind of Grace Conley. You can keep running and look and I can't tell you how many times she's hit a door, that she's hit a wall, She's hit banisters on our stairs. She's she's tripped over countless toys because she's not focused on where she's going. She's distracted by something that's around her. Hebrews 12, 2 speaks of our focus. It calls us back to one of the most simple truths in all of scripture, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. If we want to remain faithful, 
We have been given faithfulness as part of the fruit of the Spirit. But we're also instructed to cling to Jesus, to focus on Jesus, to to fix our eyes on him. And when we focus on him, the temptations of the world, the trials that we are walking through, the distractions that are screaming for our attention, those things don't go away. But we just become so much less concerned about them because we are focused on something that is far better. We are called to be faithful. We are given the gift of faithfulness, but it doesn't happen on accident. Theologian Jonathan Edwards once said, a true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. I'm gonna read that part again. A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is his great concern as the business of the soldier is to fight. So the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. Those words this week hit me like a brick in the face. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been walking through life just kind of hoping that I got it all figured out, right? But to live the life that we're called to live, to live a holy life, to be like Christ does not happen by accident. It happens by setting our eyes on Jesus, by clinging to Jesus and by blocking out the distractions, casting off the sin, casting off the hindrances that want to drag us down. And we make it our business to be like Christ. And friends, that's a a tall order. But we have been given everything that we need in Christ. When Paul writes Ephesians, he says, you have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. We have been given salvation We have been given spiritual gifts. We have been given the fruit of the Spirit. And all of this gives us the ability to live, to work, to lead, and to love the way that God has called us to. But none of this happens by chance. This happens by choice. And the language that Hebrews uses gets a little scarier as we keep reading. Verses three and four, for consider him, that's Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. And then this last little line, in struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Friends, I believe that faithfulness begins with remembering who God is and what he has done for us. But faithfulness is is also about staying the course over time. It's about long suffering, if you will. Faithfulness is one of the marks of a devoted follower of Jesus. A person who will stay in the fight, a person who, who will keep on fighting, who will keep moving forward, who will continue the course no matter what the obstacles are, no matter the trials or the tribulations that come our way. And we have the perfect example in Jesus who exemplified faithfulness as he was cursed, as he was scorned, as he was beaten. He stayed the course to honor God and to offer us salvation and grace. We have been given the gift of faithfulness as part of the fruit of the Spirit. And God himself has given us the ability to remain faithful. So the question is, will we throw off every weight, every sin, every hindrance, resisting it to the point of shedding blood? 
or will we submit again to the yoke of slavery that we have already been freed from? You know, for some who are here today, you needed to hear that that there is a faithful God who loves you and gave everything for you. He pursued you by sending Jesus to take your place and to pay the penalty for the sin that is in your life. And he wants to give you grace and mercy and love in greater ways than you can even fathom. If that's you today, I want you to know here in just a few moments, there's going to be a chance uh, for you to respond to the Lord, to to pray with me or pray with our prayer team who will be around the sides of this room. And it would be a great privilege to, to talk with you and answer questions that you may have about church, about Jesus. But there are some here today who have resigned themselves to a life that is shackled by sin. There are some who have accepted the gift of salvation, who who have said, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord, and, and I wanna accept that sacrifice, but have not walked faithfully. Today is a day to take a step of obedience. Today is a day to cast off those sins, to cast off those struggles, and to hand them over to God and say, Lord, I want you to free me from this. I want to walk in the freedom that you've already given me in this. And you may need to grab somebody who you came with and and take a moment to pray. You may need uh, to come down front and use this uh, stage as an altar and get before the Lord. You may need to grab our prayer team and just say, this is what's happening in my life. Would you pray for me? But today is the day to hand it over to God and commit yourself to fight. By the power of God at work in you to faithfully fight today and tomorrow and every single day after that. We've been given faithfulness as part of the fruit of the spirit and we can walk in faithfulness because of what Jesus has done. However the Lord is moving in your heart this morning, I wanna ask that you would just respond to him. If you need to pray with someone, would you pray with them? If you need to get before the Lord in a quiet spot in your heart, would you do that this morning? Let's pray as we continue. Lord Jesus, the call to a holy and a righteous life that we see over and over again in your word is is too much for us to bear. God, we cannot uh, reach that bar on our own. And so Lord, I thank you, God, that, that you have called us to something that we can't do. Because God, you sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And we thank you and we praise you for the wonderful gift that that is. God, I praise your name that you know that I am not gonna be faithful to you tomorrow. And yet you love me and you forgive me. And God, you are still about the business of perfecting me. And so Lord, I pray today that every believer in this room would would get a fresh wind of your spirit. God would be full of your spirit. We would walk in the fruit of the spirit and God, our relationship with you today would be better than it was yesterday. And that tomorrow will be better than it is today because you are about the job of finishing what you started in us. Lord, I pray for, for that man or woman in here who has yet to put their faith in you. God, would you speak into the doubts? Would you speak into the concerns? Would you speak uh, into whatever the hurdle that stands between them and you? And God, would you put someone in their life in this moment right now that would encourage them, that would pray for them, and, and God would just move them a step closer to your cross? Father, I thank you for the work that you have done. We give you this time. It's in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray.